The Tick is back for its second season on Amazon uh, uh, on uh, April 5th. Uh, uh, it, it was created by Ben Edlund based on his own comic book creation, and he joins me for today's chat. I'm Daniel Montgomery, senior editor for Gold Derby, which pools awards predictions from experts and thousands of fans around the world. Uh, so first off, Ben, uh, th this show has such a unique balance of, of light and dark tones. Uh, did it feel like you really dialed it in by the time you got to work on season two, or were there still things you wanted to fine tune? I mean, uh, tone is one of our obsessive discussions when we're working on this show because of those like vicissitudes. It's, it, it, there's all kinds of different elements we're trying to tie in, but uh, it does feel like the muscle tissue of the whole thing is stronger in season two. Like because we did the season of of kind of developing developing that tone, it sort of knows itself better. I feel like uh, yeah, there's a sense of ease and flow. It's really, uh, it's really great to be a part of. And uh, were there uh, any particular aspects in season one that you found worked, you know, really e exceedingly well that you really wanted to kind of uh, lean into more or or expand on more? I mean, uh, to my great pleasure, the like just the family around the main characters. You know, like uh, the the Everest family is. A big part of the second season, and it was uh, it was our desire to like bring those sort of peripheral characters into being around the Tick and Arthur. So we had some fabric of like humanity to play with, but that could have gone a number of different ways. That's always the you know casting determines a lot of how that sort of really kind of sticks or doesn't stick, and also the choices you make in the writing and the plotting put you in a lot of just different places. So you're never sure what you're gonna kind of come back with at the end of the season. All the bonds, all the connectivity between Tick, Arthur, Dot, the, the you know, Walter and, and Joan and uh, Tinfoil Kevin even, and just like, uh, uh, just the overkill of it, just Danger Boat. These, these characters have sort of wired into an actual little raft of people who care about each other in a way that uh, I was really happy about. Because it's really supposed to be just a throwaway comedy goofball. I mean, that's the that's the Tick's overarching thing. So it's really nice to have this other part in there, this like beating heart of story and family. Yeah, that does seem to be one of the things that sets this version of The Tick apart from uh, its previous iterations. Uh, of course, you know, since you created the show, it's been uh, uh, the comic book originally, and then the animated series, and then the previous live action series. Uh, do you feel like that, you know, are there anything else besides that emotional component that you really wanted to set this version of the show apart and, and, and really make it stand out? Well, I mean, each one is sort of its own thing. This one definitely, uh, it, each one is sort of built of the stuff of its times and also what it is. So there's a comic book, so it's going to draw directly from the comic book culture that it kind of springs up through. And that was true of the cartoon and of the early 2000s live action. And this one, we're really at a place of, this is a dawn of a whole new era of television. We're in this long form, uh, binging, it's led to uh, increasingly novelistic kind of content and uh, like an interest in, pardon me, uh, sort of, uh, you know, how effectively can you design the labyrinth of story to carry people through an experience now? Because instead of it being, I, I started working in dramatic, like I started with Firefly, let's say hour long, kind of dramatic genre, but humor infused genre storytelling that was broadcast based. And so in broadcast, we were continually urged to move away from seriality as much as we could in order to create the standalone potential of each episode, basically following a philosophy that in uh, syndication, who knows what order it's going to be um, transmitted in. And uh, who knows? so it was sort of this weird tail wagging the dog in terms of like, okay, well, those are some consumer concerns that are kind of actually hardwiring the structure and the intent of a whole world of culture. So this is, this is very 
freeing to be able to the tick is now it's as uh, narratively sort of involved a piece as I've worked on um, in the 15 or well yeah 15 years I've been working in this kind of like uh, genre live action stuff it's like yeah it's it's really been uh, it's it's I guess that's another thing I'm rambling, but that's hopefully hanging out and rambling are almost like the same thing. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I hang out, I hang out with a lot of ramblers too. So no, but uh, the I would say that like uh, that invitation to structural depth and complexity um, uh, suits my OCD nature that I've been trying to compartmentalize for a long time. Um, and and since you know between uh, the last uh, you know live action version of the tick and this one, uh, as you mentioned, you worked on on Firefly and uh, Angel and, and also Supernatural and and, and Gotham. Uh, you know, ha ha having all that experience, you know, as a writer in television and a producer, uh, you know, how did that you know did did that make you feel more confident? You know, going into this version of the tick, you know, having all that under your belt, did it inform uh, you know, the directions you took with it? Yes, I mean it informed everything. It was really crucial. Um, I don't know that it made me feel more confident. It made me. It gave me subsistence level confidence to kind of get through what is just a. I, it's a very much like a get up at, at the in the dark and run out behind the house and jump into some sort of icy pool kind of adventure to go and be a showrunner to also do that with this uh, creature with whom I've got this like long relationship and a certain kind of like, so I've built up a reality of, like I've got a drop dead Fred problem almost of the tick is in my head and has been fine tuned uh, into a sense of almost pseudo being. I don't wanna let that thing down because it's not going anywhere. <laughs> so I want the expressions of this thing to be good, right? So yeah. Those are sort of uh, some of the things that assail your confidence as you step into this. But I was well prepared by having all of these different producer and writer experiences, uh, production, pre-production, post-production, and writing experiences on all these really amazing, interesting shows. You know, um, that was great. And so it sort of felt like uh, uh, I was... I did go back to school and learn what was necessary just barely in time to begin learning again uh, uh, when I started working on the tick uh, this time. And uh, another uh, major difference between you know making the tick now as opposed to before is that you know we're in an era of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the DC Extended Universe. There, you know, the the language of superhero stories and, and the prevalence of them is is so much better known, so much more common. Uh, yeah, the, the, that affect the way that you tell this story now that you're sort of telling it to a world that's a lot more uh, familiar with these tropes? Yes. I mean, yeah, because everyone is educated to the point where, you know, we've had commercial campaigns that have nothing to do with people who care about superheroes, but there's a superhero there selling whatever product, you know, like it is totally infused. Um, that gave us a real yeah, a kind of a almost a place of indignance <laughs> where we could come from and go like, I told you uh, this was crazy. Uh, but also just we're, you know, um, we're this weird combination of uh, both kind of having fun with it, reflecting back on itself and totally drinking the Kool-Aid of what makes people love it. Um, and, and I think that combination I mean, a lot of times when something is put in the lens of parody or put it like there's a little bit less uh, affection, um, perhaps. But this is all balled up in itself and really is both a, yeah, it's, it's about the kind of things that everyone's been forced to learn, superhero tropes that everyone, whether they want to or not, it builds up a certain amount of pressure for which there could be catharsis in the form of a laugh. And that's kind of what we offer. But uh, that was never going to subsist long enough. Like uh, we, if that was the goal only, then we would have made 10 episodes and been out because police squad, 
you know, and kind of what we did in the live action previously, although it was not intended to just do nine episodes and be out, but it had a certain depth uh, that we were pursuing. And uh, I would have liked to have done more with it, but it was a long way from developing the kind of story depth that makes people, here's the thing, everybody knows about superheroes because there's 6,000 superhero shows. So to stay afloat in this particular place, you need people to actually go, well, I, I thought that was funny. I enjoyed all the laughing about superheroes, but what I'm actually concerned with is how the Tick and Arthur are doing. Like, I want to see how they're doing. How's Dot doing? She had some issues. Is she okay? You know, those are the things that sustain people now. Like, you need to make a... It's even more important, I think, to make an actual intimate human connection with these fictional projections or people just, they are totally excused to just like lose track of all of it. This, we're in a giant stormy ocean of shows. Have you noticed if you ask somebody like, it's like one of the first few things that they'll say about watching television is that there's too much to watch. <laughs> anxiety about what they haven't watched. They have a lot that they've recorded and haven't watched as if like they're just, they've got a lot of baggage actually <laughs> in the form of built up mythologies that they haven't been able to absorb. So yeah, it's a very competitive place. And I think friendship is a good way of going story friendship in a sense. Uh, yeah. Try doing it for a living where I like, th 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 that's the, uh, you know, watching TV for a living is yes. the same like, way. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, okay, so how many can you track? Like, uh, do you have a sense of how many, like, is there a, uh, I mean, th like dozens, right? In a oh, way? at least, I, I, keep a, I keep a list to keep track. There are shows that I love and mm -hmm. that I, I loved in previous seasons that I, I lost track of. And, right. you know, it's sort and of you're the, like, they're fine, they're doing their thing, just like. <laughs> yeah, it's right? like more time triage to try and get mm -hmm. it with most. Uh, yes, uh, exactly, yeah. that was fine. <laughs> Stat, stat, stat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, uh, and, and I mean, you've noticed that too, right? Where just people are responding with a kind of anxiety to the amount. And, and it's kind of an anxiety of pleasure. Like there's too much candy to eat, but yeah. it's still this weird anxiety. And it's the kind of static field with which one must compete if we're trying to communicate with people. Um, it's just a very amazing time. Like I never suspected. These are like the careful what you wish for fruitions of things that I would wish for as a broadcast maker of broadcast TV of like, let the, let this rigorous heightened form that's based on commercial breaks and come back next week. And all of these like product chilling sort of uh, imperatives, let that go away, please. And, and let uh, demographics become more personalized so that we're not just building things for these uh, like massive audiences that are basically driven by committee streamlining, right? Those things happened. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, like to be candid, although, uh, you know, it's just like there's, it turns out that turns into like broadcast paid a lot. <laughs> um, because we had this captive audience that was made captive by a certain kind of build, just the system of FCC bandwidth and distribution and all those things, right? Um, freedom is great and wonderful creatively, um, but now we're in a place that there's just so much that, uh, I, yeah, from the point of view as a of a creator. For me, I very much vet and who, I don't want to just make stuff because there's too much stuff that also serves a very lazy impulse that I maintain. But like really think about whether or not a thing has something going on in it, a meaning, a purpose, an additive purpose, right? Um, I think this would be the time for all creators to maybe think in those terms because it's very easy to get a, a series up and running and get the profits before you start making it from an international distribution deal. Not easy. I don't, I'm not, but if you're in a position to do it, you can do it with a lot of motive force coming from investment now. Um, but there's a lot of things that, you know, are really just 
sort of frantic schizophrenic regurgitations of culture <laughs> that may not be helpful. I don't know. That, who knows? Uh, well, uh, you know, season one of the Tick, um, you know, you you were reintroducing this world to, to people who uh, were familiar with it or weren't familiar with it, uh, and now season two, uh, you, you know, you're entering, you know, exploring the world of of Aegis more, this you know superhero organization, adding new heroes and villains. Uh, what's it like now that you've built the the, the sandbox, uh, kind of get, getting to play more in it? This season? Um, it is uh, wonderful. It's like uh, uh, that extension of world is exactly what I wanted to get to. Um, sort of pursuing, like what I was talking about before, like trying to hook people in, I, it just became, it felt like it was important for the, the show to start at a certain speed and be very like surprisingly reserved in this thing that it was expected was going to happen, which is just fun all the time. Like, it's kind of a rainy day. It basically starts on a rainy day. And Arthur's having a rainy day until the tick shows up. There's no real sun. And then the sun comes out. And then we go through a season in the first season of a hero's journey that brings him up to basically where the myth has always started for the tick and Arthur, which is Arthur can't be a hero and an accountant. So he chooses one and they get to work. And then things start happening. This season was that we got to get things going. There's just a basic pulse rate of, uh, if the heart was beating at a certain pulse rate in season one, it's just getting up and it's increasing. And that's a heart that's pumping this sort of comedic mix of, or this blood mixture of comedy and um, caring. Uh, so, yeah, the thing's up and running. That's really cool. And then we just get to have more characters kind of roll in. The philosophy of storytelling this season is more of an omnivorous one, less about just one big bad and more about a sort of a, a series of different things that happen, more like life, and it leads to better comedic destiny, uh, comedic density, and also comedic dens density. Oranges, let's just keep going. <laughs> uh, what other difference, uh, other difference with this version of the tick is is that it's very uh, uh, interested in very specifically ticks kind of search for identity, uh, where he's always kind of been this mystery. And here, it's act you know, you're actually sort of clued into oh well, where is he from and and what mm -hmm. is his origin and uh, what was that decision like to kind of to bring that, to make that mystery kind of a part of the show, part of the story. I mean, it was everything about this one is intensely like I became a sort of a meta textual sort of just obsessed with it and sort of a student of especially on Supernatural, which lent itself uh, to it just happened to be that Kripke was very playful in this regard and other uh, writers on that very talented staff. Also, just everybody kind of looking to see how the meta levels of this story could kind of be reflected back on itself. It's always been something I've been interested in. So from the beginning of doing the tick again, it became this like, okay, a sort of a, a meta journey. And uh, um, it, and that the tick especially lends itself to that because it's a parodic kind of, uh, it's, it's satire and parody and it looks back on itself and on the medium and on the genre that it's a part of. So, the idea that the tick was originless is one of the things that is one of the essential ideas of the tick. There are these kind of essential through lines of the tick. Arthur's one of them. Um, you know, the, the terror kind of is one of them, really. He goes all the way back to the comic book, and there's something about that old world of supervillains and the agedness and just something about that's old, something important. But who the tick is has sort of accumulated as a question. And so, I, like, when I was thinking about whether or not to do this again, I was trying to figure out why would one want to do this again? What can one add to the story of all of this? And that is a big part of what I think is a story that can be told now. Um, and it'll take a few seasons at least to kind of work, like, unspool it because, uh, but I, I have an answer for it and I'm excited about it. So that's something that, developed over time and that's about working on the same story for 30 years 
So, uh, yeah, uh, more answers to come. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ben, and good luck uh, with the show this season, yeah. and uh, good luck, uh, fingers crossed, at the Emmys uh, later this summer and yeah. uh, and, yeah. and, and, and the fall. Uh, yeah. And for everybody watching this, please uh, hit like and subscribe. Uh, you can see more from our channel and more uh, of our interviews throughout this Emmy season uh, by looking through our Emmy playlist. Uh, thank you again, Ben. Thank you so much. All right. Have a great afternoon.